Hey there, and welcome to the Apartment Building Investing Podcast. I am your host, Michael Blanc. I'm really excited you're here today. I'm also excited about my, my guest. His name is Michael Beeman. You may not heard of him, but this guy's gonna inspire you to take some massive action because he basically is gonna talk about his journey from bankruptcy end of 2016 to quitting his job at the end of this year. And he's gonna do it with just two deals. I love these stories. That's what my book is all about, Financial Freedom with Real Estate Investing, this yellow book here doing really, really well on Amazon. If you haven't gotten it already, grab this book because I would love to put his case study in there, maybe in a reprint I put in there. It's so awesome. It really talks about the law of the first deal. But you're going to love his story because he started with nothing. Uh, I mean, bankruptcy uh, for income, he started splitting wood. And for his family of seven kids and did this to save up enough uh, $12,000 to get started with real estate investing. And now he's closing on a 61 unit and he's quitting his job at the end of the year. So holy moly. All right, so let's get right into the interview with Michael Beeman. Here we go. Michael, welcome to the show today. Hey, good to be here. I'm so excited because you're another example of how multifamily can achieve financial freedom. You're just probably a few months away from, uh, from quitting your job. Yes, yes I am. Uh, looks like uh, one of the deadlines is probably gonna be November 19th, which is, which is when we close on our first uh, big syndication deal. All right, let's talk about that. We'll, we'll, let's work back in time. We get the 61 unit you're working on. Just talk about it real quick. It's really exciting. Well, we are. Uh, we were raising funds, and I think we have most of them in place. But it was uh, it was a portfolio kind of single mom and pop managed. Uh, the guy had a full time job. It was mom and pop managed. He was doing a halfway decent job, but we were able to get it at uh, what we what was equivalent to in Springfield, Illinois, of like a nine and nine point two cap which was uh, really, really hard to find. But in the Midwest, it's not terribly hard to find, but for one that's already operating, has the financials and everything, that's really hard to find. How did you, how did you he, find it? Uh, well, actually, I was asking a broker for about another property, um, and uh, he said, well, I have this one that I haven't even put on the market yet. Um, he said, would you be interested? Um, he said, I know it's gonna scare off some, um, some guys because it's not big enough for the on-site management. And uh, he said, so um, would you be interested? Well, I'd already had been approached by some other investors about partnering with me because they'd seen my success because uh, we have, we started May 15th and we have 64 units now. So, um, so they'd seen some of our success and they wanted to partner with us on some bigger deals. And I said, well, that would allow me to do this. So then we just started from there and I uh, got the LOI accepted after we went through the property, realized the value adds that we had there because the expenses were running really high. And uh, so that's where we're going. We're, we're excited to move forward with our investors. So. Uh, this is great. You're glossing over some really important things because you kind of take them for granted. But one of the things you said is that the you got this from another broker who said they hadn't quite listed it yet. So everyone yeah. that's listing, that's kind of like the pocket listing kind of thing. That's like where all the magic happens. Oh, how are people getting deals? That's exactly like that. So let's back up the truck a little bit more here. In okay. order for this, in order for this broker to tell you that he's got a pocket listing, he must yeah. obviously like and respect you in some way. Why, why does he even call or contact you about this pocket listing? Well, I actually, um, I actually, he he took a week to get me back, get back to me on the other one, and uh, he because he thought he'd already had it sold. I was just a nobody to him. Had he never done a big deal with me or anything like that, and uh, he took a week to get me back. And uh, I'm kind of hard to reach at times, so I got, you know, voicemail. I sent a voicemail back, that type of back and forth thing. And then uh, he said, you know, I go right by your place on Interstate 70, because I'm on Interstate 70 almost right between Indianapolis and St. Louis. And he goes back and forth between them. And he said, I'd like to stop and meet you. So he stopped and met me. Um, I showed him around what, some of what we do, and then we just had long conversations. And then that's when he brought that listing up. And he said, uh, because he basically was just wondering if it was going, if I was going to waste his time. Well, so. that's exactly right. And because these guys get calls from all kinds of tire kickers and newbies all the time, so you must have probably used uh, the right language when you called them. Yep. And I think that the turning point was when you get to when you meet him in person, and you either tour a property or better yet, yes. you, you allow him to tour some of your properties and you build up that rapport. Is that a fair thing to say that the in-person meeting was kind of the turning the point? The in-person meeting was crucial. Yeah. It was, and we see that all, all the time. My schedule, he was coming through at a certain time, and I said, yes, I'll be there. So, and I think it's because it sets you apart from the 95% of the other people that are just tire kickers. They're not actually serious enough to hop on a plane, get in a car, or do anything yeah. like that. 
Yeah. And so I, I do think that that in-person element is, is pretty huge, especially if you think the broker, you know, actually has some kind of deal flow. I mean, some brokers only have a deal like once every blue moon, right. uh, you know, do you want to waste your time with them? I'm not exactly sure, but that's yeah. where the magic happens. And we've had, yeah, that is, that's exactly where the magic happens all yeah. in person. Yeah, you build up, you build up this rapport, you go see a deal. Oh, it doesn't work out. Oh my gosh. And maybe you look at another deal. It doesn't work out. And all of a sudden, boom, you get this, you know, off market kind of deal. And that's mm -hmm. kind of, that's where the magic is. So it's all through relationships as well. I think you said the other thing that you glossed over, which is uh, you were starting to raise money earlier in the cycle. So it's not like you put this 6,100 unit on a contract and then start hitting the phones. What were yeah. you doing? What were you doing vis-a-vis -vis your investors before this? When did you start and what were you doing? Well, basically, uh, some people had reached out to me um, after uh, meeting me on, you know, real estate forums and talking to me and asking me questions. And I have a tendency to take on a mentor role when somebody asks me a question. And so I have a tendency to just, I'll, I, these people, I'd spent hours on the phone with them already, um, just trying to help them out with little things here and there. And uh, so they had mentioned, you know, I'd like to partner with you on a deal or two. So. I didn't know exactly what I had. I also knew that I had a decent amount of equity in some of my buildings, but I was like, I was confident because I only had to raise a half a million dollars because it was, it was a smaller deal, but uh, a half a million dollars. I mean, I started the business 18 months ago with 50,000. So <laughs> a million dollars was something for a, you know, I'm, I'm a Midwesterner, you know, seven kids. So I have a, uh, it was, it was something, but then once I started showing them what we were doing and, uh, um, what we'd already done with what we were with what um, and what I was looking at and what I was looking for, um, they started their excitement grew as well as mine, and um, so we just went from there. But yeah, I had I had some reasonable commitments before I went toward the property, and then before I put the offer in and the LOI in, I talked to them about what we needed and made sure I was pretty darn close. Um, I think we're what like fifty thousand dollars away, which I, I expect to fully expect to uh, get funded here within the next week or so. And uh, then we just pushed forward. Yeah, so we started with fifty thousand dollars eighteen months ago, raising five hundred thousand. That actually is a big achievement. And and probably yeah. when you were sitting there eighteen months ago, thinking about five hundred thousand dollars, it probably overwhelmed you a little bit, right? Oh yeah, man, I never even considered it. I uh, the background on our business was um, just you know a notion in my head uh, two years prior to that, um, you know a notion in my head because. I had, you know, I got married five years ago and I had, uh, she had three kids and I had three kids and we had one together. And so now it was all of a sudden, you know, my $60,000 a year in the Midwest, which feels like uh, you're really making decent money, um, was nothing. <laughs> you know, it wasn't going to make ends meet. So I started, uh, started out, I was like, well, I'm going to start a firewood business on the side. And I knocked down like $15,000 profit, which made it closer to 75, which wasn't too bad for that first year. And then, uh, but man, it was a lot of work. So I said, I got to find another business. And so I kind of had this idea where I stepped aside and uh, said, you know, I always thought whenever I was renting, you know, which was pretty much by this point, like only three or four years before that, that these landlords are really making good money and uh, on some of the properties that I had rented. And so I said, uh, which, you know, that was a gullible thought process of a guy that hadn't done it yet. <laughs> but uh, so I thought, um, so I thought, you know, I'm going to learn real estate while I'm splitting firewood. So I would put my headphones in and uh, I had some soundproof headphones and I would be run, running a chainsaw and uh, running um, split while well, splitting mall, some firewood splitter and delivering firewood. And I was just, I probably listened to, man, I, I can't imagine a thousand hours of podcasts and uh, of books, every real estate book I could get my hands on. And I managed to save even even with a family of nine, I managed to save back $12,000. Well, then I brought up my plan to my brother and my mom. And, and uh, they, got re supportive, I'm sure. they got rejected, yeah. Oh. They oh, rejected man. me. So, so then I brought my plan up to, I, I was just talking about it. I was like, well, I'm just going to push forward with $12,000, try to find myself a duplex or something or single family house, and I'm going to go forward anyways. So then with that attitude and my excitement and knowledge, uh, my best friend said, you know what, I'm going to put 20,000 with you. What would you give me if I gave you 20,000? I said, I'd give you one quarter of whatever I do. And uh, then I talked to, then my mom heard about that and she had uh, felt bad that because she, she really wanted to do it before, but she had felt bad about going along with me and not my brother. And so she went ahead and said, can I have one quarter for 20,000? And so at this point I had 52,000 
and I was looking for the deals. So, so this is an interesting phenomenon. First, your mom wasn't on board, and then she saw someone else come on board. You're like, oh, I, I want to get on board. Yes. And you see this, and I don't know if you see that, but we see that phenomenon a lot with investors. So your first, at first, the first one is really, really difficult. And then when, yeah. when, when you get your first one on, then you have some come off the fence. And then, then there's still others who are still on the fence and they're waiting for you to do your first deal. And when you see you first do your first deal, they, they come off the fence. And so exactly. it's a snowball effect. Is that, is that a similar experience for you? Oh yeah, it is. It absolutely is. Um, and it even was uh, when, you know, partnering in the future there too. Um, and as far as with investors, and uh, if one investor sees that another investor has already partnered with you or something like that, and they, they're like, you know, he does have a track record, and he does have people that are talking good about him, so, you know, maybe it is okay. And sometimes they might come in lower than what you want them to, but you're getting them in, because after you get them in the first time, you give them good returns, it's a lot easier the second time. Because I have one guy, we partnered together on an eight unit building, he brought in 24,000. Now on this deal, he's bringing in 200 of the 500. Uh, well, investors, will, well, they, they, they tend to test you. You said my minimum is $25,000, and they might have a million dollars liquid, they're gonna invest exactly your minimum just to see yep. just to see what you'll do with it. And that's exactly. very, very common. And once you, once you show them that you're, 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 you're responsible, you're doing a good job, you're communicating well, all of a sudden they start investing and then they bring all their friends in because they can't keep things like that quiet. And yeah. once we have that snowball effect. So if I'm counting correctly at this point, you had, you saved $12,000 by splitting wood for crying out loud. And then you yes. got 20,000 from your best friend. You gave up 25% of the deal there and then 20,000 yeah. from your mom, another 25%. And then what did you, now what'd you do? What happened next? Well, now I had to find the right deal. And I was looking at this single family house and I was thinking, ah, this isn't. And then all of a sudden out of nowhere, I was talking and talking and talking about my business. And I always encourage people, man, you just can't shut up about it. You gotta be, you gotta have that excitement. You gotta be pumped because it turns out that to my friend, one of my friends that was just hanging out one night on a Friday night, sitting around a fire and uh, it was of an evening, it, it was kind of cool, so I think it would have been like around February, March. He said, you know, my girlfriend's mom used to manage this six unit building, but she said it's vacant and in pretty rough shape now, but uh, she said it's got, still got a good roof, good structure, and she said the units just need redone, and somebody can make money on it, but she knows the guy that's selling it, and he's selling it dirt cheap, and so I said, uh, I'm interested. <laughs> I said, I'm interested. Let's go look at it. And so I went and looked at it and uh, it was essentially like an off market deal. I bought it for, I think I bought it for uh, 25,000 less than what he paid for it. Uh -huh. uh, he took the loss just because he was sick of dealing with it and he, he had never done any training, never learned anything. And so he had just, um, it was just kind of the stepchild for him and because he ran his own oil business. Um, he was actually a reasonably high net worth individual and he's just like, okay, eat the loss and let the place go and I'm not paying taxes and insurance and everything all the time for something that makes me no money. So, so we went ahead and got it and uh, you know, that was a six unit building. I think we, we paid 60,000, we poured 40,000 into it, but we got 100% financing on the 60,000 um, because we co-signed the notes. We got 100% financing and we, we, go ahead. Yeah, let me ask you about that because once again we're glossing over important details, Michael. How <laughs> in the world do you get 100% financing on a deal? This is not just loan to value, it's loan to cost, right? Yeah. What, what happened prior to that that some banker would say, oh, God. Well, okay. I know well, you're I have, to, yeah, no, I mean, but, I've been in still. the business world a little while, so I knew how to uh, approach a commercial lender. Okay. So I started my LLC. I approached a commercial lender at a small local bank, and uh, he'd already worked with our other family business before. And I said, here's my plan. I laid out spreadsheets on spreadsheets, exactly what I was going to do. I mean, I, I came in organized. You don't come into those guys. You come, they like to hear about your plan, even though, you know, we, we've all heard the old saying about, the, um, you know, a plan, a, a plan is nothing, but planning is everything, you know. And so I, I came in that way, and he wanted to know I was doing that. And he said, you know, you're going to spend an awful lot on this building. Would you be interested in 100% financing? And I was like, uh, yeah, yeah, no, I'd be interested. No, not, not that. <laughs> so, so what was but your plan? Had, what was your plan then? So you went to get this. So now you're getting into the banker. Hey, yeah. buying him sixty, putting him forty, hundred thousand dollars, and obviously there must have been a plan that really appealed to him. What was that plan? Well, my plan was I was going to go unit by unit. 
um, replace flooring, uh, repaint, put uh, in, in a lot of units, we put new, new uh, countertops, uh, refinished cabinets. Um, we did, uh, I mean, we did light fixtures, outlets, uh, bathrooms, you know, all of the things that, you know, a tenant's going to walk in and be like, hey, this is a pretty decent place. And so we went in to do that, and I told him this was what I was going to do. I was going to cash flow, start getting the thing cash flowing with two or three units, and then I was going to start using all of the money. And I promised him that I was going to leave the money in the in the business for a while because I really wanted to grow it. He said, uh, you know, whatever you do with it, you know, he said, I'm only testing you on one unit and <laughs> one deal, and then you, uh, you know, you show me what you can do. So we had that thing. Uh, we when we were still doing that thing, we um, we ended up taking on another project at the same time because that single family house I was looking at, that was a really big single family house and that was my boo-boo. But anyways, um, we can get into that later. But so we ended up going through it and uh, we have I, even one of the units, I'm kind of a little embarrassed to say that somebody was just kept bugging me about a rental and they've been a good renter. I've been in there like 13 or 14 months and I never even got to rehab it. <laughs> rent it up, and one of the units rented up, and uh, so she's paying, and and it's been it's been a great it's been a great one. Um, shoot, I I think what's it rent up for thirty two thirty three hundred for the six units, and uh, um, you know I think we ran expenses last year. We're running around forty two forty three percent. So yeah, that's fantastic. What was it doing before? What was the rent before you got in there, and, and what is it now? Uh, there was no rent. I mean, it was vacant. Oh, it was totally vacant. So, I gotcha. So, so I basically had to really know calling around to the other places that had one and two bedroom apartments and find out what their vacancy rates were, uh, what they could rent things for. And then I, you know, kind of went off of that and did, um, did what I could with this building. And once I got it filled up, man, it just, I, you know, I tell people all the time, I was like, and I'm actually in the process of possibly selling it to another investor because we wanted to move into larger properties. Um, but I was like, I was like, honestly, I said, this one kind of, uh, it's one of those that I don't want to sell, but the value of it now is so much higher than when I bought it and the bank wants 24 months for me to refinance again, since they gave me hundred percent financing. And now that the buildings were 200,000, 220,000 or whatever, they won't refinance against it for 24 months. And that extra hundred thousand that I don't for, it's really more like $120,000 that I don't have out of it would take me six, you know, 12 months to wait on it. And I'm trying to do bigger stuff. And so I said, uh, uh, so I put it out there and, and a couple people hit me up. So I'm in discussions on selling that property as my very first property, which kind of hurts you a little bit, but you know, you got to, you've got to be willing to move forward and be creative. And that's been one of our things is we were extremely creative. I mean, even we come upon a deal, a five unit deal one time um, that we don't currently own. And it's, it's a great cash flowing property, but we didn't have the money to put down on the deal. And we knew we, and it only had, it had four vacancies and only had one renter. And she was a 101 year old woman paying, paying 300 a month for a two bedroom apartment in a market where, and I mean, no market, I should think should be 300 a month on a two bedroom, but a market where a two bedroom apartment should easily fetch you 550, 600. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we, we ended up, this woman, I never raised her rent, but we ended up um, borrowing the money to get the down payment from a family member at 10% interest. And we ended up, you know, getting creative. And then we started in there, got a carpentry loan after we bought the property, they allowed us to do a carpentry loan and then did um, refinance out most of our cash, paid everybody back after we got the thing rolling. And it's, it's still cash flows, $200 a door. Um, on the four doors, the other ones break even. <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, you brought but, up a good point. You have to be creative, right? Yes, so, you have to be have, extremely creative. We don't have money laying around. You're like, uh, you know, how do I, how do I do this? How do I overcome this stuff? So it's very clever. You borrow money. You're paying ten percent interest, which is a lot. It's right? a ton. It's a ton, and you you don't feel good about it at first, but then you're like, you know, this building's returning twenty five, thirty percent, and you're like just do it. And so then after we did it once or twice, it was like no big deal. And every time we could burr out of something like refinance out of something, then we would to try to get all our money out. But most of the time the banks are getting to where they're like, you know, I got to have 24 months pro forma to refinance or anything like that. So, so, it, and if you want to keep buying and you want to keep growing, you've got to get creative. So um, we've done all of those things. I still have two notes that I pay 10% interest on because <laughs> I can't refinance out of them, but I have so many properties that, that are, 
bringing in 25 to 50 and some of them are infinite because I refinanced that I was able to refinance out completely so yeah. it's just uh, it's just how creative can you get if you want to grow if you want to if you want to get you know 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 what you're doing and get creative and and take some risks you have to take some risks uh, as well but speaking of taking a risk sometimes it doesn't always go your way because you mentioned some kind of boo boo let's talk about that Yes. <laughs> so uh, I did something. Um, I was looking around and I saw a, uh, it was a large old house that was oddly set up, super easy to turn into a triplex with everybody having their own stove, fridge, everything. I mean, it was just set up weird because you walked in almost into a corner of the house and there's immediately a staircase going up. And so I thought, well, you know, I could turn that upstairs into it because it had four big bedrooms upstairs. I could turn that upstairs into a two into a two bedroom apartment and the downstairs had two bedrooms already. And so I said, uh, you know, I could turn this into a duplex. And then I looked over at the garage and there's this big, um, you know, two, two and a half car garage. And I said, I could probably turn that into a duplex too. And so I talked to a contractor and, uh, and he said, Oh yeah, I can do that for X amount of dollars. Well, it became crystal clear about one month in that that wasn't going to happen. And so, but why, as it turns not? out, What's that? Why wasn't it going to happen? Because he was obviously unqualified and was not going to follow through and was just kept asking for more and more money. And so huh. you get that feeling whenever, and my mom, my wife called it out first. Uh, if you, if you have a woman in your life and, you, and she's a strong, trustworthy woman, um, I, I kind of use her for judgment. Um, she just makes great judgment <laughs> as far as people's character. I can run numbers all day long. I can have good ideas and I can push forward, you know, like a bull, like a bull in a china shop. But she will stop and sometimes think, you know, that's that that's not a person you want to be doing business with. And so she she called it and then what she did point out, one of the guys on his crew was that uh, the guy was actually only there like two days. He was just helping him out because he was of relation to him, seemed to know way more than anybody else, and was actually just a freelancer himself. And she said, you should talk to him. She said, that guy knows what he's doing, and he hasn't done anything anything the entire time or behaved in any way that would make me question his judgment. She said, you should talk to him. See if he wants to finish this project. And I did, and he did. And he kind of salvaged my butt on that one because I, I ended up spending more than I should have, but the property still cash flows because of that and because of him. And so I started a long-term relationship with him as far as my contractor, and he even does my maintenance. Um, and uh, he, he brings on help when he needs to bring on help and uh, I so actually after about January of this year um, we found I wanted a way to get him on board so I wanted to get this guy on board I wanted to hook him because I, went, I was like you know I can't find these people you can't find this guy that will do the work it's always got my interests at heart and it's not trying to overcharge me I said because eventually this guy is just going to go take off and do his own thing because he's not an idiot He's, I can see he sees the big picture. So I brought him in. I said, I'm going to start another holding company. Would you be in? I said, I have this deal over here. It's, uh, it's a single family house, and the woman is, uh, the family bought another house, and they're just trying to get out from under it for what they owe on it. And we can burr this thing if we buy it cash, and we can burr out of this thing and get all our money back, plus own one, one all our money back, plus about $5,000. And so I did it to where I was like, all you have to do is put in 5,000, I'll put in 5,000, my mom will put in 5,000, and JC will put in 5,000, we'll all be one quarter partners. And so he agreed to that, so about March of that year we closed that deal, and now that company that I started with him, because we used a lot of the same tactics, uh, is closing on a duplex um, in two weeks and closing on a triplex the month after that. We already have all our financing and everything lined up. And that will put that company at 15 units. That's really cool. Yeah. And so I brought him on and now he's there. He's like a part of the team. And so he's like, he sees the vision and he's going forward with me. And I never have the stress ever again of, do I find a good contractor? And so that was a strategy that came to me. And I just, you know, I went for it, even though I was giving up half, you know, one quarter of a small portion of a deal and down the line, I'm sorry. And, uh, and so it, that strategy worked, and so now I can present to investors even. I'm like, no, I don't just have a team. I have the best team because my partner, JC, um, the, the, one of the initial investors, he is an uh, insurance underwriter. 
he started a property management company with me to manage our own properties and he figured out systems to put in place. We do YouTube video walkthroughs. So if a tenant will we'll post on like Facebook marketplace, free, free advertising, a vacancy, they will ask us about it. We'll send them a YouTube video walkthrough we'll, and he set up software and um, he set up a whole system to where he could um, take applications online through rent tech. And so he's starting to, he's teaching me this stuff, but I was always, he's like, no, go out acquisition. You figure out the deals, you do this stuff. And he was able to be such a strong partner in the background, helping me out with the back end of stuff. And then I could handle acquisition. I, I talked to, I'm the one that handles all the investors. I handle buying and selling. I went ahead and got my broker's license. Um, but that team that we can present is also another thing. It's like, I don't have the problems that other other people have. I just haven't had those since, ever since I decided to make it a, a team sport. Yeah, you just reused the word team like a dozen times the last 90 seconds. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if you noticed that, but the team is team is so important, right? So I'm a <laughs> blueprint guy. I, I get up and distill things down into like three easy steps, right? Yes. But, you know, step number three somewhere is, is your team and your first member of your team was your wife. I mean, yeah. what an asset. If she can look at someone and go, now this guy's a knucklehead, this is the guy you want. Oh my gosh, right? Oh yeah, it was a lifesaver. I'm similar to you, I'm very analytical, right? I can just bulldoze through on paper and spreadsheets all day long, but yeah. my wife is much more intuitive than I am. Yes, she and is. And it's great to have someone uh, on, on your on your team that helps. Yeah. And so without her guidance, she wouldn't have you know found this other contractor and it's kind of blossomed from there. But I've always found it really is the strength of the team. It I'm really is. So many levels, so yeah, that's, that's fantastic. It it also comes with it. It also comes with its uh, downside too, which is like trying to get or trying to get everybody on the same page. And uh, so, um, oh, it's oh, it's more than worth it because you find as long as you find the people with the right talents and have the right attitude. Um, and I did remain in in my main company that owns most of my units. I I had controlling share. And in the other company, I basically have controlling share because my mom's just investing in me. She's not investing in a deal. She's That's investing, right. so she'll always vote my way. So I really do have controlling share, but I don't want to move forward without my team being on the exact same page. So I will sometimes take extra time to go over deals and explain to them why it's a good deal, you know, what we're going to do here in comparison with other deals. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to take on that extra time when you have a team and it's not just you, but man, it's so worth it if you, if you have the right people with you. Yeah, so, so true. Because I can't change an outlet. I, I can't. I can't lay flooring. I yeah, can't right. do these things. So <laughs> That's right. So your, your timeline is, is pretty impressive if I'm counting it counting right. So late, late, the, late the 2016, you were pretty much in the dumps. Yeah. And I, I want you, you know, and, and then you kind of said, oh, my gosh, I need to pull myself out of this stuff. And so uh, May of 2017, which was a, a five months after you were basically like at, at, in, at the bottom of the barrel at the moment, yeah, uh, you do the six unit deal and and now you're doing a 61 unit deal and you're going to be quitting your job at the end of the month. So if I'm counting correctly, it's two years from the time that you decided to start this thing. And you started from a really an impossible position. Yeah. I mean, can you try to can, it, can you try to articulate why you are where you are right now? Because you really had so many obstacles that you had to overcome. What is it about you that uh, puts you in this place that you are today? Uh, my wife says, <laughs> my wife tells me I'm the American dream. Um, she said, you are the American dream. You are proof that even when things get really hard, if you're willing to, you know, buckle down. And she said, she said, uh, I knew, and I, I had faith in you completely because you just go for things. She said, you were listening to, she said, you were listening to po uh, podcasts and books and every evening, even after I was just wore out and I would sit down with her and I talked for a little bit and I'd be like, do you mind if I listen to this podcast? And she was like, no, it's okay. So she'd sit and she, she'd sit and listen to podcasts. This, she's an amazing woman. I mean, she just is, but she'd sit and listen to podcasts with me. And she tells me that I'm the American, I'm the American dream. Like I just, uh, I don't quit even when there's obstacles. I just keep pushing forward. Even like uh, when a deal isn't working out, um, I was grasping at straws when that one contractor, you know, and I looked at, I looked at it as like, well, man, I'm going to end at, uh, with this six unit deal and this other three unit deal that doesn't get totally complete and I'm going to be out of money, <laughs> you know? And I was like, well, there went that business as far as it's going to take it, you know, another three years for me to cash flow into finishing this project out of my other six unit building. And so, uh, but you know, I got creative. 
I took her advice um, and I just, you know, by the end of, uh, you know, in the middle of that project, while I was, while we, when I, before I got a hold of the other contractor, I was trying to lay trim and quarter round and lay flooring. And she was like, you just never quit. Like you just won't let a project die. And uh, so in my opinion, I don't know that it's anything more than just being willing to never quit, um, getting knocked down and just getting right back up, um, getting creative and building, being willing to take some risks. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So let's fast forward uh, two, three, four months end of the year, yeah. the last day of work, and you're home at 2.30 in the afternoon. What, what, is, what do you think that's gonna be like? Uh, I don't know that it's ever gonna be like that. I, I, I can't stay away from it. I'm in love with it. I mean, I love, my I love my job, and so I told them on the side, if, you know, if somebody calls, I'll try and still uh, help them out. But uh, I, I love this. I'm going to keep going forward, you know, like a rocket, and we're going to get done with this syndication deal. We're going. I'm going to try to oversee it, do everything that I can, and uh, give my investors good returns. And I fully expect other investors to want to invest with me and do another deal. Um, I'm going to seek out other investors, and I'm going to, uh, you know, keep going forward. I don't see myself ever being at home at 2:30 in the afternoon. Now, I did promise my wife five years from now that uh, we would. Uh, I would tap on the brakes because my, my dad passed away at 52 oh. and he was the same way. I mean, he built that business, the Selma business that my family runs. He built it in 95 to um, have a 21, 22 employees. And he built it from, you know, him just having an idea of logging, you know, and, and growing up in it a little bit. And so he built a business like that, but he died at 52. And so my wife is scared for me that way and I get it. So I think that uh, I will get to where I don't come into the office at 6 a.m. I'll get to where I, you know, I'm willing to leave the office at noon or one or two. Um, but right now, I, I just, yeah, I'm quitting one job, but I'm kind of just, I don't see myself. It's not really a, it will, you know what will be nice is when my wife says, on some days when my wife says, hey, you know what, let's go do this, that I will just be able to say, okay, you know, that, that, that will be the only thing other than that, being able to go to, um, being able to go to all my kids' sports events on Saturdays instead of constantly working, and and all of those things, uh, those those will be pretty cool. Um, now I'm not the terrible dad. I'm not missing all of my kids' sporting events, but you know how I mean. You know, to always be there, um, being able to take the kids to the park, doing some extra things. I on the weekends I take my kids. Uh, we have a little 22 target sheet, and so I. I've been able to do a little bit more of that lately because I'm never, I'm not stressed and going back in for extra hours at my job, you know, because I have passive cash flow now. And so like on Sunday, we had some family in town and uh, they had never, they knew that I, I like to rifle shoot and stuff and they'd never done it. So I was, you know, I got to do that. And I got to do all that. And I didn't have to say, Hey, you know, I got a call and I've got to run into the office and there's some things I got to take care of, you know, like, like most of us, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, corporate cronies have to do. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that, that will be a time in life. And I promised my wife that we would look at other houses down south and warmer weather. Um, when I have a good leasing agent in place that's taking care of things and I'm more on only acquisition side, because right now I am having to, you know, I'm running that property management company and I'm running my um, acquisition side. So, I'm doing, I've got, uh, I've got a lot of jobs actually. I'm not quit. I'm quitting one so I can add, keep three more going, but, <laughs> but yeah, I'm going to, uh, that's kind of just, I'm just going to keep going forward. So I can't be, I'm not the guy that's going to be on here telling you about how I'm going to be drinking margaritas on the beach, you know, in a couple yeah. of months. I, I really do think retirement is a myth. It's yes. not only a myth, but it's not really a goal, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, it's kind of boring. To, you yeah, know, but you got you got to do something with your time. I think the difference is that you do it under your own terms. Yes, exactly. It is. That's that's the thing that I most look forward to, and the thing that I've enjoyed just a little bit because I've taken I've taken days off and vacation off a couple times for my wife, and she, you know, for the first two years of our marriage, she never saw me take any time off. Mm. So, and here October twenty sixth, I'll be five years marriage for us, and we're going with uh, my my maintenance my main my main contractor guy. Him and his wife and me and my wife are going to Florida for four days. We got ourselves, uh, you know, a uh, I don't know, an Airbnb with two bedrooms and stuff like that. We're going to just hang out, hang out down there and just relax for four or five days. And you know, I never, I never would have been in that position financially if I hadn't been for real estate and for 
you know, chasing, uh, chasing a dream and starting a business. Well, Michael, I'm so glad that we crossed paths. Uh, you are an inspiration to thousands, literally, uh, coming from the position you did and the time frame you did. So uh, what's the best way for people to uh, connect with you? Um, my phone number is 217-508-8185. Uh, I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn. Um, my email <laughs> is michaelbeeman at beemanandsons.com. So I don't know if you can put that in my bio, but uh, that's, those are probably easiest ways to get to, through to me. I probably have two or three guys that are just newer investors that reach out to me all the time. I was, uh, you know, they'll reach out to me and I'll say, can we schedule a phone call? Because I like to schedule things. But, uh, but yeah, I all the time trying to help people out. Yeah, that's awesome. We'll put in the show notes. It's uh, themichaelblank.com forward slash session 136. Michael, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your story. All right. Thank you, Michael. All right, here's some of the highlights I got from the show because I'm always trying to figure out what are the nuggets in the show? What is someone saying that, that I find really valuable and you might find valuable? One is, number one, he talked about enthusiasm. I don't know if you caught that. When we're talking about raising money, he talked about enthusiasm. And this is a great way to boil down the money raising process. You're actually not going out there and raising money. You're not going to call up a, a friend that you haven't talked to or an acquaintance or coworker you haven't seen in two years and go, hey, I'm getting in this apartment building stuff. I, I need 100000 Are you in? Right? They're going to say, no, I'm not in. What are you talking about? Instead, really, what you're doing is you're sharing your enthusiasm with people. And you're not really looking for an agenda, though. You're looking for opportunities. But bottom line, you're in sharing your enthusiasm. And that's what he talked about. And that's really a key component in raising money. Uh, he also talked a lot about creativity. I don't know if you caught that as well. And I just love that as entrepreneurs, especially when we don't have anything, it gives us no choice but to figure out how can we make something happen out of nothing. That's what entrepreneurs do. They make stuff happen out of, out of nothing. And he's always creative. He's always creative about this. I don't have any money. Well, uh, you could have said maybe I'd try to raise it. Okay, he did actually raise it um, through some friends and family. And he worked and kind of saved up some money and he cobbled it together. He did a one on seller financing. He got 100% financing from a, from a bank. So he's constantly looking for how can I get this deal done? It's not like, can I get this done? That's a foregone conclusion. It's a mindset thing. But how can I get it done? And the other one, I, I, I called it out during the show, but he mentioned team in about you know, 90 seconds a lot. And the importance of the team is so important, no matter what you do in life. It could be anything, really. The people around you are so unbelievably important. And so having strong team around you elevates you and allows you to do a lot, lot more. And you know the, the quality that, um, that sets in part, he says, was never quitting. And we see that a lot. We call it hustle. We call it uh, never quitting, just getting it done. And if you look at the pattern of my podcast guests, there's a, there's a pattern. Uh, some people are more established, more mature, more, quote, successful. But if you go back and how they get started, it was all through hustle. And in fact, even now in their, in their successful phase, they're still hustling. The bottom line is they're hustling. They never quit. And I think it's a quality that kind of pervades all successful people is this mentality of hustling and never quitting. So hopefully you guys got some good nuggets out of that show with Michael Beeman. And he made a mistake of leaving his phone call. That's his real own fault. So by all means, give him a call. Light up his line. All right. So appreciate you guys. If you love the show, let me hear from you on iTunes. Leave a five-star review. Uh, love to read those as well. So appreciate you so much. Take care. Catch you on the next episode. All right. I hope you enjoyed that. Now, the next step, download this ebook right here. Okay. When you've downloaded that, uh, make sure you also subscribe to my YouTube channel because then you can get all of the videos that I release as soon as I release. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel right now. Click on that right now. And then also make sure that this is the next best video to watch is this one right here. So hope you enjoy that. I'll catch you next time.